The following program is a production of KHET in Honolulu, Hawaii Public Television. The following program has been funded in part by grants from the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts and the people of Chevron in Hawaii. Haleakala Crater lies the district of Hana. Beautiful Hana is rich and fertile, bathed with sunlight, caressed by soft trade winds, and overflowing with pure mountain waters. This gentle land beckons the children to play. Blue, pristine, offshore waters yield a bounty of food. Cattle thrive upon the land, and the people of Hana never go hungry. The people of Hana live in a special harmony and capture a closeness that is rapidly disappearing in our modern world. Hana is such a unique place to grow up. It was fortunate for me to be raised and brought up in this area. Although our surroundings were, were kind of isolated from, you know, central Maui, Pa'i, Wailuku, Lahaina. But I think uh, these surroundings, which is so unique and which is so important, not only for me, but also for my, my, my children that is growing up in here in Hana. It is so important for us, uh, because we are isolated, to live the way we live, which is very simple. Uh, we live off the land, we live off the ocean, we kind of help each other, we support each other, especially the families in Hana, the Ohanas. Uh, one of the greatest things to, to be raised in Hana is you are somehow related. Uh, Hana gathers its strength from the cocoons, from people that has been born and raised here. And they, they love the Aina of Hana. I do too. I've been away for some time. I was glad to leave. I was happier to be back. Centuries of invasion, combat, and conquest fill the history pages of this most desirable of places. Graveyard and birthplace to both royalty and commoner alike. The spirits of those who once made Hana their home echo from the distant past. My name is Luukia Pilekai. First came to Hana in August the 31st, 1916. When we came, they had an old pier down there, and we had to, the boat had to park out, and then uh, we come on a rowboat to the pier. We came to Hano, I guess my husband was sent from Bailuku to work for the county over here as a mechanic for, you know, we came with the first truck for the Hana district. Life has been good to me, and I enjoy staying in Hana. Uh, there was a, a great uh, uh, physical disturbance, and uh, I arrived on the scene at about 5 o'clock uh, on the morning of July 25th, 1914. And when I was growing up in Hana, it was a beautiful paradise. And, uh, and uh, even while I thought it was the end of creation at the time, uh, in later years I learned that this was the, the, uh, the uh, end of the rainbow. My first introduction to Hana was in 
February of 1942 when I was assigned as district commander of the Maui County Police Department. A lot of things were happening out there during the war. The police department was the major agency in Hana. There was no military there for a while. And about 1943, uh, a contingency of the U.S. Army uh, did come into Hana. But prior to that, the police department was the whole show. Uh, my wife was a Hana girl. I was teased her by saying that I hired her as my secretary with malice aforethought. Six months later, we were married. So Hana to me has been, as I say, a very, very special place. When I got out there in 1942, uh, the sugar plantation was going uh, full blast. And that was the major economic entity in the whole district of Hana, which extended all the way from Kailu to Kaupo. Uh, the district had about 3,000 population at that time, and now it's just a little bit more than 1,000. So almost all of the uh, economic life uh, revolved around the plantation. 90% uh, of the jobs at that time were plantation related, either directly or indirectly. About 1944, the plantation closed down. It was no longer economic, and they were losing a lot of money. They were in the red. So the uh, parent company, which was C. Brewer, decided to close down that uh, plantation. And let me tell you, that was a very traumatic experience for the people of, of Hana, because the main job source just disappeared. What was fortunate for the district was that a multimillionaire by the name of Paul Fagan came on the scene and he had been a stockholder of C. Um, Brewer and Company and he decided to buy the entire plantation which he, uh, which he did in about 1944, so between 44 and 45 he developed uh, that whole plantation into a first class ranch. So my recollections of Hana will, are always of, of the ranch, being born and raised on it, Hana being Hana Ranch. Hana has always been cattle to me. It's always been a ranch way of life. It's always been a rural way of life. I hope it remains this way. The last year on the ranch, we have been going, doing a lot of learning uh, about the HRM, Holistic Resource Management process and one of the parts of it is goal setting and we have about a year ago we we sat down with uh, all the employees of the ranch and the owners and the managers uh, of the other uh, divisions of the Rosewood company here and we uh, formulated some goals we put down on paper our goals these are goals that we would like to, how we would like to see Hana Ranch 50 years in the future. And uh, it came out that all of us wanted Hana to remain the way it is. We want it to be rural, uh, pastoral, uh, landscape. We'd like the ranch to remain a ranch. We like the cowboy lifestyle. Um, the hunting and the fishing. We don't want it to develop any more than it, it is now with just the ranch and the hotel. And uh, we'd like to see Hana Ranch be successful so that Hana can remain the way it is. Well, you got to have dogs in this mountain. Dogs is the absolute necessity. No dogs, no pig. Well, you, uh, you can sometimes. A miracle happens. You go up there and a pig is in the way, you know, or something. But uh, normally you take dogs. Very, very few hunters over here go without dogs. You have to use dogs to find a pig. Most of the hunters here used the old surplus carbines, mm. old go, uh, World War go, II carbines, go, go. 30 caliber. And we use the soft, soft point bullet. Because the, the military type bullet, which is the solid one, 
it'll go through a pig. I've seen it, and uh, well, Lawrence knows the thing go through and right through the dog's foot. Mostly for food. Very few go for the sport and throw it away. It's to bring home and make use of it. If two people go, we divide it in half. Then we bring home, we give to our brothers and sisters, whoever can make use of it. See? They make, they don't throw nothing away. Make sausage, then you can make it in la la, you know, with the tea leaf steam, and you can roast. But don't make stew out of mountain pig, because smell come out, see? Gotta be dry, I don't think. Stay right here, right here. Right in here, Lonnie, right in here. Come on. Come on. I came here about 10 years ago, and I had been coming to Hana for about 12 years, oh, it like and it always just seems like such a, a beautiful, remote, this, special, this is spiritual kind of a place uh, that I didn't realize it had uh, no, actually, gotten under my skin until uh, I had been here for a couple of years, and uh, I had been visiting Hana, and so I decided I would buy me a small parcel of land about five acres, six acres, and I had heard that the Hana Ranch were selling some agricultural plots. So I came over one weekend to look at them, and uh, uh, for some reason or another, I asked if they had something a little larger. And so they showed me some larger parcels, and so then just so happened that all three parcels that I liked were contiguous, they all joined, and uh, so I ended up, instead of five acres, I got about 500. This is the beginning of uh, some of our macadamia nut orchards, and uh, we seem to have, right now is the blossoming time of the trees, and they have the beautiful blossoms, and they have a lovely smell. It's almost like an orange blossom, but not quite as heavy. We're coming into some of our macadamia orchards here now. Oh. Mm. I wanted you to see this. This is kind of special. This, these are some of, to me, some of the biggest banyans in uh, probably the whole uh, state here. There's about, uh, you can sort of see the size of these things by, by my getting over here. Sort of insignificant in this great temple here. But um, interestingly enough, these, these banyan trees, there are about seven of these in a row here, and they were all started, this, there used to be a railroad through here that carried the sugar cane, and uh, they used the cross ties of the railroad where banyan, was banyan wood, and this land is so rich that they rooted, and consequently you have these beautiful majestic trees. It's a little bit like uh, Swiss Family Robinson multiplied a few times. And, uh, These are macadamia nut blossoms. I don't know where this is interesting to your audience or not, but they're interesting to me. <laughs> and then after the flower falls off, you'll have uh, this little thing left here. And on the, each one of these is, forms a nut. Uh, they, of course, all don't live because if they all live, they would probably kill the tree because they get so heavy and big. But then okay. I, after the nuts form, on, after the blossom is dropped, they start growing on little uh, pieces. Can you see this? All right. These are little small uh, macadamia nuts that have just started. And they have a husk on the outside, and then they have a shell on the inside, and then the nut. And then these will, uh, when they get ready, they get big enough, then they'll fall to the ground, and we pick them up. And that's how we harvest our uh, macadamia nuts here. My idea of a vacation is coming home to Kay and I. I love this place. You can't help but love it. I, I never tire of it. It's like being in love and being happy that you found what you want and you've got it. You know, it's, it's there for you. This is a place where one comes to find himself. Even if you've been in the city in Wailuku for the day, we always feel like you got to get home. You got to get back to the country, back to K and I, because of the clean air, the mountains, the ocean, and the feeling of family is is very prevalent here. At uh, Uncle Harry's, we try to do a lot of Hawaiian crafts, like the kupunas here, the elderly do a lot of hala making, and then we, we buy from them. You know, everybody try to be a winner. 
But this is a family operation, and also my dad do uh, wood carvings, bows, trays, and I do some of the sculptures. It's in the back of me, uh, tikis, uh, woman faces, more on the sculptures. Like uh, here, when it rains during the winter, we do a lot of carving, a lot of sculptures like that. Like during, if, if nice and sunny, we clean the yard or work in the taro fields like that. But mostly, uh, in my uh, condition, I, I love to carve. Doing sculptures, uh, milo, out of milo wood, out of coal wood, few monkey parts, but more on uh, the texture of the wood, the dark woods, milo and coal. Hana is a special place where, when we perform or do the hula, it's uh, because it is surrounded with such beauty, you know, um, and the people here being how they are. It's a joy to teach it. Um, it's wonderful to perform, to dance it, because there is this special mana that we have here. That what comes from the land comes from the people. And I really feel that the people here in Hana are um, blessed. I feel blessed being here. I'm sorry I can't talk about it without crying. Um, because I feel strongly about Hana and its people. It's such a very special place, you know. And when we when I do the hula, when I teach it, um, I feel so proud. The hula has so much to say for our people. You know. um, it's an education for our youngsters so that when they grow up, they will have some of their culture, hopefully a lot of it, uh, because at one time we were losing our, our culture. You know, but now it's coming back, thankfully. And um, I think when we are surrounded with such beauty, it brings out a lot of the good in us. Um, makes it easier to perform, you know, and a joy makes it a joy. And I feel that the children, even the adults, um, just love doing it, you know, they enjoy it. Churches along the Hana coast were built uh, basically one day's ride apart from one another and were probably originally grass shacks. Uh, there was a grass shack here at the base of Kawiki Hill here in Hana that preceded one Honolulu church uh, here. And uh, this church wasn't begun until 1842. It took 20 years to complete the construction of it. There, there were heavy populations, of course, out beyond Hana, out into Kaupo and on around into Kanayo and Ulapalakua. But there was no connection. Uh, it took 10 days to ride from Hana to Kaupo on horseback or muleback in those days. Most of the commerce was by water, but there was very little communication between churches and they became quite independent of one another at one time because there just was no way for people to communicate easily with one another out here. Then when Sugar died along the coast, beginning in Kipahulu and working its way back up to Hana, in each little village that the sugar industry failed in, the people would all move out because there was no work. Uh, little by little, the houses would disappear, but the churches would be the last thing to go because they would always try to protect the churches and the graveyards and try to keep them up as well as they could. And so a whole series of churches along the coast became sentinels of something that used to be that isn't here anymore. Uh, and there's a group of us that have been working uh, over the years to try to save a few of them so that they're not lost uh, for all time.
people, a lot of our Hawaiian people are now coming back to the Aina. And I hope in the future that more would come back. They're losing this land. The reason they lose the land is because they moved away, they did not pay the tax, and you know, a smart aleck guy come along and in the back of your back is paying the tax, you know? The Hawaiian people were such a trustworthy people. They trust everybody they see. Even if you had a knife, they trust you. You're not gonna poke me. Soon you're back turn, bingo, you had it. But, you know, I hope the future is not this way. I hope the future is that, hey, brother, I can come to your house, like, today. Hey, and the brother said, brother, my door always open to you, you know? And this is what's happening today. I don't know about someplace else, but in Hana, you walk into one Hawaiian house, you got my house, no more door. You're a big dog. <laughs> but no more door, I don't need that door. Because I get nothing to steal, you know? All what I got is all in here. And uh, this is how I raise my family. And this is how in the future I hope they raise their family. Well, I think of Hana as a very rural Hawaiian place. And I'd rather live in that type of setting. So I'd like to set my life in that terms. Uh, I think everybody who comes to Hana has that in mind when they come to Hana. I think as the other parts of the island build and become more like a city, as Hana can remain as it is, uh, rural and uh, not overdeveloped, I think our value is more increased, and I, I think that's what we should be looking for. Hana is probably one of the most uh, Hawaiian places in Hawaii, uh, like Molokai, but Hana, there's a lot of feeling about it love of the land and when we talk about aloha aina love of the land it is there and the native people not only hawaiians but of different uh, ethnic backgrounds feel very very uh, much attached to the district and so while they realize that they need uh, some development out there they want to be sure that that development does not uh, raise havoc with the lifestyle the place is called hanawain village and we intend to demonstrate, exhibit Hawaiian arts, crafts, and the culture. Our long goals are to establish a living village. Living villages, when you're coming in, you're gonna be educated toward what some of the crafts were, how they were made, what, they're, what were they utilized for, and how the changes have, are taking place and what type of materials that we are, are, I guess you could say, adjusting to. We want to be able to serve the general public, at the same time satisfy our Hawaiian community as far as the quality, as far as the, uh, the genuineness of the Hawaiian culture. I plan on uh, living here the rest of my life. Uh, this is home for me. And uh, I, uh, I'm originally from Alabama, and that's home too, but uh, this is where my roots, uh, I mean, where my life will continue, I hope. Hope the good Lord sees fit to let me live here. We won't ever see the old Hana again. Things will, will only move in one direction, and that's ahead, whatever that is, whatever they mean by saying that we, you can't stop progress. Uh, my honest opinion is that we are going backwards. This is not progress. But how can you stop it with the uh, explosion in the world population? When I was born, uh, there were only a billion people on this planet. Today, I noticed where they were celebrated the five billionth citizen of planet Earth, five billion. There are a number of factors that will help to keep HANA pretty much the same over the years. I think the key one among them is the desire of the people that live here to have no change. Hana is special not only to those of us who do live here, but to people elsewhere in Hawaii look at Hana as a very special kind of place, and everybody wants to protect it. I think a combination of enlightened government, uh, tight zoning, enlightened ownership of things like the hotel and the ranch that don't want to make radical changes here, I think Hana has a real fighting chance to stay Hana for quite some time to come. I'm often asked to describe or define Hana. That's almost impossible to do. 
Hana is sort of a, a state of mind. It's, it's an aura. It, it's a feeling that you get when you get there. Oh, we use fancy words like a, the ambience is the special and all of this. But there is something to that. I know that uh, you know, I go to Hana a lot. And when I get on that highway and start driving into Hana, as soon as I get to Kenai, I have a different feeling already. I want to slow down. I want to stop. I want to smell the flowers. A lot of flowers to smell. I want to look at all of that beauty. Take my camera out. I'm sort of a camera nut. And I'll, I don't know how many pictures I have of Hana. It's, I take the same pictures over and over again, thinking that, well, today there'll be a little different shadow, a little different per perspective in the, in the pictures. But it, it, it is very special. Then you get out there and you start talking to the people, and uh, I don't know how, how to put this in words, but I, I seem to find a genuine uh, character to those people. They, they're so open, they're so honest, they're so sincere that you feel that there's nobody there that's going to try to take you for a ride. That the people there are truly in love with what they have, and they really want to share that love with, with everyone who comes. Whether you can participate in that kind of love depends on you. How, how do you explain paradise? Uh, you, you just can't. You have to go out there and, and, and feel it. Spectrum was funded in part by grants from the people of Chevron in Hawaii and the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. <laughs>